So our uh, next speaker is Elizabeth Herman. Uh, Lily is a professor of landscape architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design. That is your title, isn't it? Where's that? Somebody on? put it on the website, but <laughs> on the website of RISD. Yeah. So Amazing. and uh, a director of a uh, of the design lab at RISD. She's in, uh, she's does stuff all over the world, but she's going to talk about Rhode Island. <laughs> The, the um, landscape part is sort of strange. Is that yes, technically I'm in the home of landscape and yet I don't teach anything there. And I teach in architecture when I teach in a department, but mostly I teach across disciplines. Um, so Howard, who I just met in India, and that was a very um, wonderful encounter with you. <laughs> we won't talk about the rest. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, we were talking about our shared interests and, and realized that we had many. So he asked to ha um, if I could talk a little bit about sort of the situation or the background for all that, I, that, I, that, we're, that I'm going to present here. I do mostly work internationally, and, and so just to give you background, I'm actually trained as a scientist, and then did my first three years of um, graduate school at the medical school at Johns Hopkins. And I left, um, I was telling Carolina, is she here? Yeah, who's from Brazil, but I spent those three years working on Chagas disease, and um, which impacts 80% of the rural population in Brazil, and as I was working on this disease, I realized that it, one could easily actually break the life cycle of disease by changing how people were building their settlements, the density at which they were building their houses, the materials they were making their houses out of, and I was silly enough to talk about this, and everybody kept saying, that's not medicine. And I said, yeah, but aren't we here to kind of get rid of the diseases? And they said, that's not medicine. We don't know what you're talking about. So finally, after three years, I said, that's the problem, is that I'm not interested in medicine, per se. I'm interested in the issues. And so that's been the story of my life. So I left Hopkins, went to Cornell for grad school in design. Um, back in the mid-1970s, you couldn't get into an architecture grad program if you didn't have an accredited grad program, if you hadn't come out of an accredited undergrad program. So somebody suggested I would go through landscape architecture and do the architecture curriculum, which I did. <laughs> which is why I laugh when I'm labeled a landscape architect. Um, and then later went back for my PhD in Islamic societies, pre-modern Islamic societies, and how they were redeveloping their cities in relation to changing medical theories. So the issues have remained the same in my life, and rather what I'm interested in is how people tackle those issues. And so what I, when Howard told me about this um, symposium, I was really excited. And um, this morning, I became even more so. And I have plans for you all, <laughs> including you, John, so watch out. Um, OK, so um, I do run this lab. I founded this lab. I run this lab. I've been at RISD and at Brown University for 20 years and was always frustrated by the siloization of the different disciplines. And so I, I very quickly became affiliated with the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown, where I could break down ideas of what designers do. And um, didn't have to listen to people anymore say, wait a minute, you teach at RISD and you do what? So um, we focus uh, internationally on social justice issues. We focus on social and economic empowerment. And we, um, and we work in, in different, there are three partners and or directors, co-directors of this lab, and this is where we work. So my world, um, I went from working a lot in the Middle East to working mostly in South Asia. Um, the Bay of Bengal is kind of my, my, the center of my world. Um, one of my co-directors who Howard has met is, uh, came from Colombia. He um, has been working in some of the, the most um, um, under siege parts of the country. He, um, 
He worked partly for the government. He was also a faculty member down there. And they've been using education as a way to combat um, the, the, the power that the guerrilla and the paramilitary have over that country. My third uh, director is Cuban-American, and her family left Cuba in the 50s. So um, again, it's an interesting constellation of people, and um, you're seeing the result of it up there. So um, Design Lab was really founded as a way to bring together all of our work to foster issue-based learning, to foster in the field learning, and, um, and to really try to understand what the creative process has in solving these really messy problems. Um, so at the core of our approach, and I'm getting to Rhode Island, but at the core of our approach um, is this idea of the steam box, which uh, comes out of woodworking. The idea being that you have a defined territory, and I think Kelly was describing the perfect steam box uh, this morning, but you have this defined territory that has an increased um, set of conditions, a heightened set of conditions. In the case of the woodworking, it's, it's temperature, it's moisture, and within that, your, whatever is within the box is having itself fundamentally transformed into a much more agile, resilient, um, set of conditions or, or, um, or things. And so we use this metaphor for everything from the classroom to working with very messy community issues. Um, so this is where I normally work. Um, this is actually Dhaka, Bangladesh. I worked there for many, many years. It's interesting because you're working with a population that uh, has no legal land rights um, and, and at the same time there's no land the land will disappear from day to day. And in Bangladesh, because it's in one of the most active deltas in the world, or the most active delta, what's land today is water tomorrow and vice versa. So really interesting water rights issues, land rights issues, human rights issues. Um, I've also been working, or the lab's been working for a very long time in Kolkata, India. Um, four months of the year, it looks like the upper right-hand corner, as does Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, we've been working in the red light districts. Um, We've been working, again, with slum communities. We've been working with very poor neighborhoods that were slated for demolition in the name of, of rebuilding for tourism. So in all of this, um, we, we don't do small projects. We actually help communities and our partners build strategy. And um, I'm currently in the process of submitting a new graduate program at RISD that will be about critical practices and strategic design and it will be interdisciplinary. And again, it's, it's a graduate program focused on, on the approaches that we use. So this is actually coming out of the work we are doing in, in Calcutta. And over time, we've been further and further refining our, our approaches as we've changed who we're working for. And we keep looking for models that, um, or components of strategies that are replicable and can go elsewhere. Um, Three years ago, we were invited into um, uh, northern Sri Lanka and eastern Sri Lanka to help with the post-war reconstruction. And it's, it's taught us a lot about um, what we didn't know about building partnerships. Um, it told us that our old methodology of trying to be below the radar screen of the government doesn't always work. Um, when the government is um, becoming more of a dictatorship, when the country is heavily militarized, um, everybody, all of the Chinese spying apparatus knows exactly where you are every minute of the day. And so we're having, again, to totally rethink the model. And these are just some of the charts that we've worked on, again, looking at partnerships. We do work um, with public-private partnerships, but it's usually local government, not national government. And where we've ended up there, just to get beyond South Asia, is we're now working, um, we've actually moved out of the north. We were working in the city that the, was the Tamil Tigers headquarters. It was totally destroyed at the end of the war. There was genocide. So we're dealing with not just a lot of physical destruction of, of bodies, of families, of, of culture, of physical infrastructure, um, but, but we're also dealing with real trauma. And so out of this has come, uh, you know, we have a lot of questions about what, what needs to happen in the immediate, um, in the moment when you first get invited in to work on a particular set of issues in these, in these very devastated communities versus what do they need for the long haul. 
So what happened, how we got to back to the States is through my partner, um, Daniel Feldman, who came from Columbia. So he came last year on a state, not last year, uh, a year and a half ago, I'm forgetting now, um, on a US State Department exchange uh, with Latin America, and he was coupled with, with me, which was really lucky for me. I almost said no. <laughs> And um, he, as Howard could tell you, is a pretty remarkable human being. Um, and he um, had been teaching at Haveriana University and helping run a research lab much like the one we now run and together. And he said, you know, let's bring our people together with your people and focus on something local. And because he's now in the States. And I said, hmm, I haven't done that in a while. And so I started looking around, and 10 minutes away from Providence, where we teach, um, is the little town of Central Falls that everybody in the country heard about when they fired all their high school teachers in 2000 and whatever it was. It'll say on the next slide. Um, it's a, or two slides. It's a, a very small city, a mile square, 19,000 people. It's the smallest, densest, poorest, most culturally diverse, um, on and on and on. City in Rhode Island. It was the first city in the country to go bankrupt in the recent recession. It's literally been to hell and back. It went into state receivership. The government was thrown out for corruption. You know, the list goes on. Um, and I found out that, as you can see, it's got a very high Hispanic um, population. And the population is 65% Colombian Americans. And Daniel and I went, wow. Wow, suddenly it's no longer the global and the local. Suddenly it's all been smashed together. So we started a program where every summer we bring together um, up to 50 architecture students from Bogota to work with RISD and Brown students coming from architecture, interior architecture, industrial design, engineering, <coughs> urban studies, development studies. You know, basically we take whoever's interested enough to, to come join us. And we work on projects that are for the public good within this city. And the city has no money to pay anybody, so this has been a real blessing for them. However, before we did anything, because we didn't want to just be doing projects, um, we, the city had never had a master plan. They had only had financial plans. They had never had any kind of physical master plan, so we said, Let's do that. Let's spend a year doing this, um, this master plan and figure out how our small summer efforts can add up to more than the sum of the parts. So, so that's what we did. And I'm going to show you very quickly um, the first summer. But this is the city. Um, they partly started dying. The textile industry started dying in the 70s. The Colombians were brought to Rhode Island because there was no trained workforce there. So they, starting in the 1960s, they started bringing skilled textile people um, and um, uh, loom repair people, which was an interesting comment from this morning, you know, who, who is there that can still fix a sewing machine? Well, they had nobody that could fix their looms. Um, so they brought them all from Columbia, and 10 years later, the industry died. And um, a lot of people moved to South Carolina, and then that industry died about 10 years after that. So. Um, the railway, railroad stop being shut was one of the first steps, um, and then slowly property began to be boarded up. People began to move out. Everything started to go into foreclosure. The city lost all its property. The houses started to burn so people could get the insurance money. A lot of families didn't actually leave. They began to uh, cluster. So about, um, I think almost three quarters of the city was abandoned, but the people were actually there living in, in greater and greater density and living in their houses. So we also talked this morning about what happens when the big companies move out. Well, this was the last big company that moved out in the middle of our master plan. And everybody went into shock. And nobody, it was only 88 jobs, but for a little city like this, this was like the final death knell and at that point, we said, um, you know, hold on, and I'll, I'll get back to that later, the, the Ostrom story. And the only industry that still remains, so half their beds are empty, is the Wyatt Detention Facility, which the city built in order to bring in more taxes 
and they built it in their prime real estate along the river. So what, where you actually have an asset that you could, you know, both create a better quality of life and get money from, they gave to this prison-like place. And ironically, that facility is full of immigrants who are, have become illegal through um, either not coming into the country properly or overstaying their visas or whatever. So what happened was um, a year ago, uh, they held elections and they elected a 27, recently turned 27 year old Colombian American from the community. And he turned around and hired a 24 year old recent urban studies graduate from Brown to be his planning director. And so we said, when we heard all this, we were like, yes, <laughs> they don't know what the hell they're doing. They're learning through doing and this is exactly what we believe in. And this is what we try to get our students to do. We are really trying to prepare our students to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative, to be very nimble, to not be locked into their discipline, but rather be able to move as opportunities and needs change. So you can't really read this because it's come out of a different publication, but, um, but, we, but it's important for me just to point out that we do work at multiple scales. We come in, we work at the big strategy scale, we work at the short-term and the long-term planning scale, we, um, we, you know, we work from the project scale to, to again, these, these much bigger strategies. And, and this is kind of the, the way we work. The other thing, as I keep telling people, is we're not ambulance chasers. Everybody comes, because we're the only research lab at RISD, everybody comes to us and says, well, there was just a tsunami in Japan, or oh, this just happened in Syria, or oh, this just happened and you need to do something. And I said, that's not how we work. You know, if we work that way, it's going to be very superficial and it's going to have very little impact. And after the Japanese tsunami, there was actually a, a roundtable discussion held in Providence and I was on the, the panel and they said, you know, what should architects be doing after, after something like the Japanese tsunami? And I said, send money. I said, send money to the people who know what they're doing and just, you know, stand back and wait until things calm down. Because, you know, if you look at what happened in Banda Aceh after the Indian Ocean tsunami, every architecture school in the world was coming up with better housing. And it was all sitting in crates on the tarmac in Banda Aceh. And the locals were saying, please come and rebuild our mangrove swamps off the coastline. Don't give us more houses. We know how to build houses. So, so those things really interest me. Um, we don't ever go into anywhere where we're not invited. Central Falls was maybe the one exception because we did go to the mayor with the idea and, and he was like, oh God, please come. <laughs> so, so that's what we do. This is our brochure for this summer Design Build Academy. The other thing that happened simultaneously is that um, RISD got rid of its design build coursework, it courses in as part of the curriculum. A lot of schools have done this, and there are a lot of articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education about uh, the tension between those who believe in actually doing things as part of the educational process and those who believe that should happen after or in your summers or whatever. So um, it had just been removed, so we grabbed it because Sylvia, my co-director, used to run it all, and, um, and so that's what we've been doing. So this is the way we began to look at Central Falls. I have to go very quickly. Um, and we started by naming it, and we named it according to what we were hearing in the conversations. And one thing that that last chart talks about is um, that when we go into a community, we, we have these two, we do a lot of mapping, and I use that term loosely, but we're doing it both from the outside in, in a more scholarly, more uh, rigorous way of you know, looking at government documents, looking at scholarship, reading newspaper articles, looking at you know, census data, and then we have the inside out version, which is really going in and living with the community and really understanding how they tick and getting beyond what they say sometimes and, and getting to what they mean. Um, so so uh, my students were incredibly aggressive about this process and I wasn't sure they would be because a lot of my students were actually foreigners and it's not their culture to go do this and they did. So. Um, uh, so my students again were uh, from all the architecture fields and then um, ID and Brown students. So the, I'm not going to go through all the parts of the plan, but the general um, 
idea was that it's a very fragmented town for only being a mile square. It's topographically uh, quite varied. Um, it has good streets and bad streets. It has a lot of these to be called Sparkle City, a lot of, a lot of drugs. Um, there, the real divide is between those who have chosen to be there and those who are there because they have no other options. And so even though there's only 24% home ownership, um, within the rental population there's a great uh, variety of, of um, kind of uh, commitment to the city. Um, a lot of local activism coming from the Hispanic uh, community. Uh, a lot of political leadership coming from that community. And of course, having the mayor hired was, was a great inspiration for everybody. So we began to focus on these two corners of the city. On the lower left is the huge Coates and Clark complex, uh, which you can see here. Uh, it's about three times bigger than that photograph. It's enormous, and nobody knows what to do with it. Um, but Roger Williams University was focusing on that, so we decided not to go into great depth on that one. We were more interested in what happened with Ostrom Sylvania, which was the upper right. And Ostrom Sylvania covers a huge part of the north end of one of the main streets. And the main streets, the two north-south streets, are really bypass streets. You get on them and you're, you shoot through, you know, if you blink, you've missed it. Um, so one of the things we were trying to do was to create stronger links between everything so that I, we kept using the metaphor of check dams. So we would slow people down through business, through, through um, interventions at intersections, et cetera. So, so that's what we were doing. And then we also focused on the center where there are a lot of schools that after the school system went belly up, a lot of locally initiated charter schools began to appear. So we were trying to link them together. That's just the core of it all. They're actually everywhere. Um, so this is Ostrom, Sylvania. So again, to have a, a, you know, a, a manufacturing center of that scale um, in this small city standing empty is pretty devastating. Um, so this larger dot is the land we were given last summer. Last summer was our pilot pro project, our pilot year, and, um, and the city had one piece of property to give us. By the way, there's a group coming out of Harvard Kennedy School called Opportunity Space. They started there. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. But they do, again, what we heard about this morning. They go and identify a city's assets that are unrecognized. So whether it's empty lots, whether it's um, buildings that nobody's really focused on, and they really start to leverage, you know, working with the city, they begin to leverage those overlooked assets. And it's, it's really pretty interesting. This is actually one of the sites that they eventually focused on, but it had already been given to us. And it also just, by coincidence, fit into one of our master plan moments where we could actually um, do a small act and have big impact. So this is what we did. We took, um, a year and a half ago, probably less time than that. This was this site was occupied by two drug houses. Um, the city came in, tore them down, got a government grant to turn it into a parking lot. Thank God they hadn't paved it yet. So they gave it to us. This is how we got it. And there's a Mexican restaurant on the right and a building on the left that's abandoned on the bottom floor. And they said, um, you know, you can do a pop-up public space here. And they're like, oh, sure, great. That's what we did. And so we started working, and because it was pop-up and temporary, we didn't we circumvented an awful lot of uh, regulations and permitting. And um, and Daniel being Daniel, things began to kind of sink their feet just a little deeper every day. And we knew that that once the city saw what we were doing, it was no longer going to be pop-up. And so they're actually in the process right now. I'm going to go through this very quickly. This is just the whole process. Um, everything was done by hand labor. Um, very hard packed earth. But we, um, um, I forget what I was going to say. But anyway, so we had no materials, we had no money, we were really scrambling. Daniel and I uh, financed this until about the last two weeks, and suddenly money started coming in. Um, we worked with a demolition company that gave us, sold us, sold us 16,000 bricks, half price. And um, 
and we used them all. And he told us, he's become our good friend, and he told us that those bricks all came from Central Falls. They all came from the old buildings that had been torn down. So we kept talking about um, how the bricks had come home. And everybody was learning how to lay bricks. Not properly, don't look too carefully. <laughs> and build foundations, which we weren't supposed to have. And anyway, it kept going. And this is um, right before, it was getting toward the end. We laid the bricks about three times. <laughs> We're hard taskmasters. We found these floorboards in the trash and wove them together into a trellis. And we had a blank wall on the Mexican restaurant that um, they wanted to come out and, and paint red or something. And we said, well, let us do a mural that's about the immigrant trail to Central Falls. So who would have known it was so hard to find um, tile? But we did and broke it up and kept building. And there were too many cooks in the kitchen, so the mural became quite wild. Um, but, but it's actually very wonderful. And it's so wonderful that the city has now put it on their homepage. And foundations, building. So we did, there was a public parking lot behind us. We did all of the prefabrication in the parking lot. We lifted everything by hand. Um, yeah. We worked until midnight every night. We had five and a half weeks to do this. And this is the plaza finish. This is our opening ceremony. As my brother said, he looked at me and said, oh, you even have a swimming pool. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> it was the kiddie pool in the house next door. <laughs> um, and what's really wonderful, this place is magical. And the people love it. Though I haven't shown you photographs of people yet. Um, they're, they're there. They come. We get daily reports of who's using it. What's really wonderful about the mural is there's a stoplight right beside it. And so at night, because it's all glazed tile, it reflects all the car lights and the changing traffic lights. We held um, festivals for the town. We kept inviting them to come work with us, but they didn't take us seriously until the end. We had a capoeira presentation. We, um, we had lots of parties for the kids. We got the kids involved. And so next. Uh, we already have designed this next park. We don't want to become the, this is the most landscape architecture I've ever done in my life. Um, but we don't want to do, we don't want to become the park designers, but on the other hand, that's what this city needs right now, and that's the land that can give us. So this is the mayor's um, pet project that we've already designed. We're not going to build it. We are trying to actually get money out of this one. They have a big grant um, to support next year's activities. And, oops, wrong way. and then uh, this next summer, we're actually trying to take on the Osram Landing Complex. So this is the landing. This is that part of the city. And this is what I wanted to get to. So when we heard that Osram was leaving, um, they also left Manchester, New Hampshire, and one other site. I forget where that one was. And I said, look, they're not shutting down this many manufacturing plants if they're not rethinking their whole business model. And if they're rethinking their whole business model, why would we let them get away? You know, Brown just got their biggest grant ever for building a whole new engineering school. They have a huge amount of money pouring into, um, into the hospital and the fields of, related to neurology. And I said, why would we let them get away? Why wouldn't we tie together Brown and RISD and industry and create an innovation lab and really try to figure out what, what you know, could come out of the collision of engineering, medicine, neurology, um, industrial design, um, you know, glass, ceramics, architecture, bring all of these textiles, bring them together and just see what actually could happen. So our proposal is the dark, uh, the, the dark gray would actually be a high-end, you know, intensive innovation lab, a serious innovation lab, you know, like the media lab at MIT. The left-hand side, which is on the public street, would all be the kind of maker spaces we are hearing about this morning. So that's where you know there can be begin to be um, some kind of, of overflow from the innovation lab into the local. And the, the red is all about a public walkway that's actually cutting into that building. It's finding the fault lines in this in this complex of structures. And where you would actually like, the, if anybody knows the Carpenter Center at Harvard, where you're actually walking from the outside in through the building and looking into the studios. Here you'd be looking on the innovation lab on one side and the maker spaces on the other. So that's where we are. And um, the government has become incredibly interested in this idea. I keep getting invited now to conferences on innovation districts. 
which I'm really happy about. Um, and, um, and Brown is somewat interested, and RISD is like, what? What? <laughs> so that's our story. Thanks. We have time for some questions. Well, uh, comments. Uh, one is uh, it's really great to see that you're engaging students in productive real world projects. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and the question I have is when I talk to people about this kind of work being done, uh, what often comes up is some relationship with uh, professionals in landscape architecture or architecture and how is there an issue or not an issue with competing with them? Yeah, it is. A, it's always comes up. You're absolutely right. So I'd love to hear what your take is on it or how you're dealing with it. <laughs> I think we're going to deal with that now with that park that got the grant. Um, but it is an issue. Uh, it's never bothered me because we have worked with communities that nobody else will touch. But now that we're actually um, competing against them for you know, we, we've actually already designed the park. We've already been hired by the mayor, but he still has to play by rules. And so it's getting a little strange. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know, to be honest, I, I don't know how to answer that. Because I don't want to compete with them. They have a hard enough time. But on the other hand, this is part of a bigger process. And we'd, we'd love it if, if they could come in and be part of the dialogue. But they have a very different mission than we do. And so it, it gets tricky. Well, it's just very opportunistic. I mean, you know, it's like they're not competing for the jobs until you, your group, or other groups actually have them or are doing it, and then suddenly, oh, but we could do it. But they weren't before that. Well, and I can tell you that that park was designed a few years ago when it was still um, a Veterans of Foreign War site, and um, it's pretty god awful what, what was being proposed. So, I mean, I don't know what to say. I don't know, and we are, but it's also, a, you're raising a different issue. Should we be in the university, or should we be a for-profit fir um, firm? And, and who, you know, as, as Kelly was saying, is just trying to build a different model. And that's an ongoing discussion, but now that we've, you know, become noticed by a lot of people, RISD doesn't want to let us go, but they also don't know how to support us, so. So you talked about the two kinds of mapping that you do here, and I'm especially interested in this, um, this kind of living with the community and getting beyond what they say and what they mean. Um, what, is there a certain mix of types of students with this interdisciplinary approach, or um, just talk a little more about that? Yeah, that's a really good question, and we did, I did, um, some mapping of my own on Design Lab last year as I was making another presentation to the Board of Trustees and the whole faculty. And I want to know who, who we were because um, I knew our numbers have been growing exponentially. And last year we were about 95 students between Brown and RISD. And this fall the students had a, um, they were part of a, a like open tables to introduce new students to new program to existing programs and they suddenly had 130 more names and I was like wow how do I manage this um, but in mapping out who we were a year ago I was amazed at the multicultural multidisciplinary makeup so it's it's a very <coughs> self-selecting crowd we have a lot of people coming from Syria from Egypt from South Asia from Latin America from Israel you know the list goes on a lot of Americans a lot of Canadians and um, I think that's great and I think I think RISD should be supporting us I mean this is one of the few um, moments where not only are all the disciplines coming together but we truly are a global institution and um, and so they are people who have been born into a world that has, that has a lot of very visible inequity and where they have grown up in families where they have been told that it's, that it's their responsibility to, to be involved. And, and I have to say in all my years of teaching, and I've taught at many institutions, that the generation that's in school now gives me an awful lot of hope. And I, I don't know, you know, <coughs> I have to go back to my own generation to find a generation like this. And it's really amazing. 
Um, so with Central Falls, do you see is it as a sort of very long-term relationship with Design Lab, or do you have yeah. sort of? We we have we um, well, our Sri Lanka relationship. We loosely put a, a ten-year um, time frame around it. With Central Falls, you could say that it could be related to the mayor's tenure. Um, of course, you could also say that we might affect the mayor's tenure. <laughs> um, so. It's not really clear. We've made a tentative three-year commitment, but I know it's going to be longer. Um, we now have this, the state senators and representatives, you know, wanting to talk to us. I mean, people are really interested in the fact that, well, first of all, RISD hasn't really worked locally very much. They've done little things, um, but this is the first big effort, and people are wondering what's up with that. And so it's, it's getting a lot of attention. I guess with just like all the projects, you seem so heavily invested that after you sort of leave, it, it almost seems like you'd have to build in a gradual departure within your so the system can sort of take on its yeah. own life. Well, we do. We're building uh, capabilities every day we're there. That's why I asked the question about you know the um, Zen bikes because. We, everything we do, we use as an opportunity to train. This summer, it was more important just to get something done. So we weren't as, as clear about that as we are in our foreign work. But everything is about building skill sets within the local population and, and identifying leadership. And on the chart that you probably couldn't read, um, that's kind of our approach to all of this. Um, we, um, <coughs> Dear, it must be catching. I lost my train of thought. Um, I forget what I was going to say. But but we're always trying to set up those structures and those frameworks so that the people themselves are in control. What we did in Calcutta actually was really interesting because the city did want to tear down this whole neighborhood, and so we, with our local partners, went in and convinced the government to slow down. And I said, because I'm very interested in cooperative structures and, and cooperative businesses, and I actually, the Japanese model is one of the most interesting because it's multi-sector, it's multi-dimensional, and um, it's based on the Swedish model, and, and then Mondragon in Spain is one of the great cooperative models. But, um, but I'm interested in these multi-scalar, multi-sector models. And, um, and we said, what if we give us a year let us work between academia, you know, business schools, hotel schools, because they want to put in this big tourist hotel. And that's why they're going to tear down the neighborhood. And, um, and let us work with all these different groups and the local community. And let's try to turn, it's actually what you were describing, your community trust. Let's try to turn that community into their own development agency so that they're in control of what happens to their neighborhood and, it, and the government isn't turning to the Thai or the Chinese developers. And so they gave us that year and we had a really interesting model that we had to leave in the hands of our academic partners to, to carry forward. And it hasn't gone exactly the way we wanted, but the one victory I can, you know, impact assessment for this kind of work is really tricky. Um, because it's 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 very slippery on you know is your objective to build a tangible product or is it to build a process and um, so however many years later what are we up to now seven years later the neighborhood still stands so so you know in my mind that's a victory one more question do you see with the students that are in this design build program that their, um, once they graduate, their, uh, what they go into differs from the typical. Yeah, it's, that's, that is one of the transitional times we're in, because I'm asked all the time by my students, where can we get jobs where they're doing this kind of thing? And I say, you know, unless you're all going to be employed by Mass Design Group, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, you're going, to, you're going to have to go out and forge that future yourself. You have to build a new model of practice. And, and I do believe there is a new model to be built, and I don't believe it has to be charity. But, but it's, we're in that time, and they're realizing that that's their responsibility. Are there skills that you focus on teaching the students on how to go make that next jump after? We have, yeah, and that's, um, 
in the programs I'm running, we do a lot of entrepreneurial training and a lot of, of, um, of, of sort of strategic action, thinking and action training. But, um, but we're not good at teaching strategy in architecture schools, I have to say. And um, we, in the work we're doing now with Sri Lanka on the Design and Innovation Center, we're going to probably be partnering with the Harvard Business School and, and Brown Engineering, because Brown doesn't have a business school. And, um, and so the students are taking those courses. And what I would like to encourage is more and more coursework in policy, in business, um, in engineering, <laughs> to, to get more of the technical skills, the business <coughs> skills, um, the organizational skills, you know, etc. Activism skills. I make them read Hillary Clinton's thesis. <laughs> Very good. Lily, thank you.